Welcome everyone. My name is Mary Eleanor Power and I am the Director of Marketing Communications for Dalhousie University's Faculty of Open Learning and Career Development. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. And thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Leadership in Healthcare. I'm joined by a number of panelists today and one who will be joining us uh, just in a short while. I'll only introduce by name and, and title so we can allow time for them to speak and for you to ask your questions. So um, perhaps if, if it's okay, I'll ask, um, well, actually I was going to ask the people raise their hand, but you can likely see their names um, just underneath their, um, their video uh, thumbnail there. So I'll begin with Brenda Lamy, who has just joined us. Welcome Brenda. Uh, Brenda is the Vice President of Professional and Leadership Development at the Canadian College of Health Leaders. Okay. And next we have Stéphane Joannet, Manager of Professional Certificates and Strategic Alliances at the Canadian College of Health Leaders. And we have Scott Comer with us, Academic Director of Executive Education with the Center for Executive and Graduate Education at the Faculty of Management at Dalhousie University. As well, I'd like to welcome Krista Smith, who is the Director of Integrated Health, Respiratory, Critical Care and Medicine at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital and is here to share her experiences as she completed the CHE designation. So I'll begin by walking us through today's agenda um, and uh, we will have time at the end for any questions. Um, so feel free to pop them in the chat or in your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll make sure that we have time at the end for questions. So as you can see, today's agenda is quite full. Um, we'll start with uh, a summary of each certificate program and courses from Scott, um, followed by some remarks from Brenda. And uh, we'll go back and forth a little bit between Stefan and Krista um, throughout, and then we'll be ending with our Q&A. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Scott to provide you with an overview of the certificate programs that we are talking about today. So Scott. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So welcome everyone. We're excited about the program. Um, we've known for a very long time that we need two, two streams within health. We need emerging leaders. Those are leaders that are fairly new to their positions or aren't in their positions, um, but are high potential to move into leadership roles. We, we need strong leaders within health. I've been working in health, just a little bit about my background for 25 years, that seems like a long time, but um, either working directly in health, with in health authorities, working with health institutes, um, and currently work with the Canadian Medical Association. So I've been in uh, the leadership piece of health for quite a long time, and it's great to see that there's these two distinct pieces. Um, if we go into that in a little more depth, so if you just want to go to the next slide. Uh, so it's broken down. So as I mentioned, the experienced leaders are for leaders with more than three years of management supervisor experience. Um, and emerging leaders are for high potential. So people that we recognize that we want to move within the system, within the health system, and we want to make sure that they have the skills that are needed. Um, there are five courses in each one, and I'm going to take a minute to go through in a very overview way what each one of those courses will be. Um, there's all, it'll be fully online. Um, the costs are roughly the same. Um, there is uh, an assessment tool. So in experienced leaders, we use the, access, the assessment tool, um, the leadership circle profile. And we have coaching and debriefing um, with, with an experienced one of our faculties who's worked with the circle profile for a very long time. And that gives um, leaders, um, much more experienced leaders, much more insight into their, uh, into their leadership, both their strengths, because we take everything we do in leadership is, is taken from a strength-based approach. And what I mean from that is that we're not, we're not taking in people to be fixed. They're whole resourceful capable leaders and emerging leaders. And we want to take those skills that they have and we want to hone those. And also um, have a lot of self-reflection to point out things that they might want to work more on or actually strengths they may want to increase. And then if you look at emerging leaders, we have the EQ assessment. We know that one of the key factors for success in any industry, including health, would be emotional intelligence and the associated skills and attributes that go with that. So we have an emotional intelligence, uh, emotional quotient or emotional intelligence assessment that goes with that. And then you have three one hour executive coaching sessions. And I think those coaching sessions from past experience uh, have been very beneficial for uh, the people that are participating in the program. 
Greatest news of all is that, um, you know, the courses uh, have advanced standing for CCHL and requirements for the, um, the CHE designation. We're gonna have somebody talk about that a little bit later. So that call you know, Canadian College of Health Leaders and the Certificate Health Executive. Um, it's great to know that any work done here is gonna, you know, uh, move toward that. So that's a brief overview of the, the courses. If we wanna drop down into what are the specific things that people will be getting. So one of the things is an introduction to leadership. Often we use the word leadership and we're not sure what that means. And, you know, if you think about how many books are written probably in North America a year, you get up to 2000 leadership books. So what are we really talking about? So we've taken some strong, um, you know, approaches to what we believe is leadership. What are the frameworks that we can use? Um, understanding um, self is a key piece of any leadership. So as an introduction, we actually will do that emotional intelligence assessment within the introduction to leadership to give people better insight into um, uh, lots of pieces of self-management. So how do you handle yourself around other people, um, self-management around change, self-management around your emotional intelligence. Then we move into teams and relationship management. So this would be, you know, how do we engage others? How do we work with the others? How do we motivate? Um, how do we create high performance teams? How do we become good team members and good team leaders? Um, then we start moving into decision making and creative problem solving. So we know in general that humans don't make great decisions. So we talk about that and we start to understand how we can make great decisions, but also creative problem solving and even more the problem solving. What is the problem? One of the things I think we've identified for many people is that identifying the right problem is one of the hardest things that we do, especially in healthcare, because it's such a complex environment. Um, systems and complexity, everything that we do, every decision we make and everything that we want to change is done within the context of a system. And that system is very complex. So we really try to give these emergent leaders lots of information around how to make good decisions, uh, the questions to ask within those systems, uh, under, an understanding of complexity and the approaches that they can take to those. And really that's the way that we transform systems. So later when we talk about the LEADS framework, system transformation is a large thing that we've been you know, working at within healthcare for a very long time. And then it's not done alone, it's done in collaboration. So we know that in today's world, we need collaborative networks. We need to understand how to build coalitions and how to build successful partnerships within healthcare. So that's how we're going to achieve um, uh, achieve our results, but also achieve our, you know a successful advantage in creating strong healthcare for everyone. So we start to touch upon those topics. So we really go in and we drill down. And with any curriculum that we're doing, you know the words to remember. It's useful. It's practical. It's relevant. And if you're not getting that, then we're not delivering what we say we're going to be delivering. So it has to be useful, practical skills. And yes, it will have theories behind it and it will have some substance in terms of that, but we want people to leave knowing that they can go do something. So in terms of systems complexity, that's great. So we learn about what it is and what complexity really is. And now we start to unpack some of the problems associated with that and then bring it back to work in a real way where people can apply the skills. So everything is centered on an, an applied practical approach. So that's a little bit about the emergent leaders curriculum. And then Around the experience, again, we have we have an introduction to uh, to leadership, but it's but it's probably at a different level. These are people who are quite experienced leaders within the health system. More reflection, more self management, um, and what we try to do in this piece is create. Um, we try to create uh, what we call an IEP, an individual effectiveness plan. So, throughout the course, we want people to start developing a plan on how they want to be successful in whatever area they want to be more effective in. In terms of leadership, we work with them to create that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a leadership circle profile. So we take that profile and you have coaching with that and also coaching around your individual effectiveness plan. So that plan moves and it's a dynamic plan that you can take out of the program and with you wherever you go in terms of that. And then obviously these experienced leaders who are in leadership roles are, are dealing with lots of complexity in a multi-dimensional organization. So we've kind of taken, uh, what we want to do is platform off of the experience that these leaders have and move it up to a different level than we would be doing, um, having conversations with emergent leaders. Strategic decision-making, again, is one of the things we really want to spend time on. How do we make decisions? How do we work strategically? And how do we create, um, how do we create a problem solving? All pulled in. So how do we deliver on strategic implementation? How do we make those decisions? How do we move? Like, how do we move forward in ways that are creating value is a big piece there. Many of our leaders in healthcare, from my experience, um, are lacking some core change principles, best principles, best communication strategies, those types of things. So we spend under time understanding um, change from both a communications perspective 
how to work in a complex environment creating change, how do we work the multiple perspectives creating change, what are some change methodologies we could be using, for example, in a lot of healthcare pro sci is the methodology that's used. So we go into a little bit of uh, some deeper work within that. And then really, everybody that's coming that this experienced leader is already wherever they're working, creating change. So we're hoping that they can take all of these pieces and then move them back into their real world and actually apply the things we're working with. Um, really working more with network leadership. So how do we network with other leaders and other organizations and create strong stakeholder engagement, whether that's internally or externally? And how do we leverage that? So you can see that most of this is leveraged around how do we take that and lead change? How do we make good decisions and that's through strategic so we can lead change? How do we do it in a multidimensional organization? And how do we take the experience and what these leaders have and actually platform from that and move forward? So it's a very general overview of the two curriculums. There's lots more uh, in-depth information that we can provide you with. But those are the basics of what the curriculum would actually look like. So I'm open for questions around that at the end. And hopefully um, we can get a little more in depth there as well if you've got questions. So at this point, I'd like to thank you and um, turn it over to um, We will turn it over. And on the agenda. Yeah, yes, yeah. You can, uh, yeah, turn it back over to me. And then uh, right. I believe um, Brenda. Yes, sharing her screen. So okay, you, I was wondering if you could see it already. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we can. That's great. Thank you very All much right. for that Thank overview, you. Scott. And um, while Brenda is just um, getting her screen up here, I will let everyone know that. Um, we will be sending around uh, an email to all of the participants and registrants of today's webinar that will include links to the two certificates that Scott um, gave an overview on. And as well, I will include links to those two certificates in the chat if you're interested. So uh, now, Brenda, over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you, Scott. So my, uh, I'm sorry, I've, my screen's over here and I'm not going to try to mess with it. So it's going to look like I'm not talking to you because I'm looking at my screens, but so I apologize for that. So I just wanted to share quickly today with you um, some of the research that the Canadian College of Health Leaders, ha leaders have has done through the pandemic about leading in a crisis. Um, I don't know why that's not moving. Hmm. Oh, is it that? Okay. No, it's not the same. Try hitting the right arrow on your. I'll just hit this. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it's never. You do it a thousand times. It's never the same each time. Um, so we, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Jason Gertz, is a PhD in leadership, um, and he has written a few articles that I'll get into what they are um, during the pandemic. And he said, the COVID-19 pandemic is the greatest global test of health leadership in our generation. Um, and, and he has lived that for the past 18 months and has driven the creation and development of content to help leaders navigate the, the pandemic. So how it started, we very quickly, you can see on here, March 19th, 2020, I did a webinar with uh, Dr. Michael Gardham out of um, Toronto, and he's now the interim CEO of healthcare in PEI, an epidemiologist. He was the go-to specialist for CBC while, when the pandemic was, was uh, ramping up. And we did this very quick webinar to support leaders. We didn't know how we were gonna support leaders, but as the CCHL, we thought we need to support our membership. And how are we gonna do this? We threw together this webinar, it was ad hoc, and we had thousands of people attend. So we knew that people were hungry for support and hungry for information on what to do during the pandemic. So following this dialogue, um, Jason came up with this stages of a crisis model. And this is, this is about healthcare, this is about um, how we work. So there's stage one, which is that March, and January, February, March is the, the escalation. And when you're, you're not quite sure what, what's going to happen, but you know things are ramping up. Um, stay to the actual crisis itself. You know, it's here, it's happening. People are getting sick, people are dying. There's no, there's no PPE. You know, we're in total crisis. The, we're living it right now. Um, and then stage three is this recovery. And it's the, it's the limbo spot. And you'll see that this, the arrow here goes back and forth because 
you know, we, we, had, we had the first wave of the pandemic and then it, it sort of declined a bit. And then we weren't, are we gonna go back into crisis or are we gonna, or is it gonna resolve? Is it, are we, you know, that not knowing what's next is sort of the, the over or the defining um, paradigm of stage three is this recovery. And I'll get into a little bit more details of the leadership during that recovery phase. And then stage four is resolution. And again, I'll get into the leadership there as well. But this is when things are settled, things are moving forward, and we know that we're, we're through the worst of it. And we aren't going to go back to crisis right away. And if we do, we're going to see it coming. There's going to be the escalation period. So Jason very quickly collaborated with some very high profile leaders in the healthcare system. Um, some of his contact, because he had done his PhD in Cambridge in England, so he had some contacts there. He, Dr. Michael Gardham, who did the webinar, Jillian Kernahan, who's a phenomenal physician and leader, um, in the, she just retired down in London. And, and they came up with this, this model of um, leadership in a crisis. So what is it that you need to, um, to be doing? What are the high, and it was a one pager, that's Jillian, that's another co contributor there. My, my um, slides aren't quite working the, as they were supposed to. But however, some of the highlights here is leadership in a crisis. So understand that it's a, it's a VUCA situation, which influences all other steps. So you're never gonna have all the information you know that you're gonna need. You're gonna have to start making decisions. And that as a leader is your job. And there, so, and, and you need to identify priorities in sequence and make <clears throat> and communicate clear decisions based on the best available information. So you're not gonna have it all. You need to make decisions and you need to keep moving. And we saw a phenomenal example of this kind of leadership and Yacinda Ardern, the prime minister in New Zealand, who just, who made decisions and she led extremely well during the pandemic. And then other points is determine the best strategy. So prior preparation and planning prevent poor performance, simplicity, flexibility, and concurrent activity. So all of these things were guiding leaders on how to lead during the crisis. Communicate often and be transparent and authentic. So these are things that were prioritized and were guiding the leaders during the pandemic. And we saw a lot of these being exemplified by Teresa Tam as she led the country. And um, I've heard since, you know, David Butler Jones did, he's a former, um, he had the role prior, two positions prior to Teresa Tam. And he said, he wasn't sure that Canada realizes that we, she is one of the best in the world and that we are lucky to have her leading our country and that she's done an absolutely phenomenal job to keep us safe. It's not easy as we all know. Um, other key points through, that lead, through this leading in a crisis. So that's that stage two when everything's in turmoil is delegate, enable trust, empathize. So all of these, but also self-care, rest and re relaxation. So these were points that we put out during the crisis you know, Jason changed his research model so that it was, he calls it rapid research, where he pulls together these key points, he sends it out for validation, we pull it together, we send it out to our members to help guide them. How do you lead in a crisis? And these are the highlights and the key points, so that there's some kind of foundation for, for people. Um, so stage three is that recovery stage that I was telling you about, where it's, you're not sure if you're going back to crisis, you're not sure if it's going to be a resolution, and, um, you know, there's the, the risk of stage three is that you wait it out and that you sit there and you wait till the crisis is over, but we don't know how long that's going to be. So there's that, you know, do you languish in stage three or do you start preparing? And, and, and what do you need to do as a leader to start preparing for either stage two or stage four? Because you're not sure where, where it's going to happen. So. Again, this rapid research model, Jason collaborated with 32 authors from 17 countries um, in all different fields around healthcare um, to come up with, with strategies to guide leaders through recovery from the emergency stages of the pandemic. And this was um, published in JAMA Network Open in just last month. So this is again, very, very rapid. Like there's this, this really quick turnaround on this research. And these are the, the 10 imperatives for leaders during the recovery stage. 
priorities is acknowledge staff, celebrate successes. You know, it's so important that people feel well validated and, and treasured. Provide support for staff well-being. People need a rest. They've been going hard during the crisis. Develop a clear understanding of the current local and global context, along with informed projections. So you're constantly bringing in new information, what's happening, what's going on. Prepare for future emer emergencies. So we know the crisis highlighted some gaps in the healthcare system. Um, we also are expecting a mass exodus of healthcare professionals who are, who are done, they want out. So health human resources is going to be a priority. Um, contingency plans, all those things that came up as a problem during the crisis, now is during stage three, now is the time to start preparing for those. Reassess your priorities explicitly. Take a look at the organizational priority priorities and regularly provide purpose, meaning, and direction. So you're, you're evolving the priorities of the organization. Maximize team, organizational, and system performance, and discuss enhancements. So how are we going to do better? Manage the backlog of pause services. This is a huge um, issue facing healthcare now. And, but you also have to balance that with burnout and moral distress. Like there's so much complexity going on. Sustain learning, innovations, collaborations, and imagine future possibilities. We saw innovations happen literally in where Chio and for example, the Children's Hospital in Ottawa went from virtual care, went, moved to virtual care over a weekend. And prior to that, they had a three-year plan to move to virtual care. And people thought three years was too quickly. And they ended up doing it over a weekend and at, with some with lots of success and they're still learning and they're it's evolving so it's and how do we sustain that rapid innovation to transform the health system and, the, and this innovation is so necessary and we'll just use the fax machine still being used as an example surely if we can move to virtual care in a weekend and a large healthcare system we can get rid of the fax machine um that's my pet peeve <laughs> provide regular communication and engender trust this is during that stage three is still communicating and that communication is just, you know, um, highlighted throughout all stages of the, of the pandemic. Um, so in consultation, um, come up with ideas to improve equitable and integrated care and emergency preparedness system-wide. So you start collecting the voices. What do you need? What didn't you get? How can we do better next time? So that article really prioritized what people need to be thinking about it, how to think about it, and it came up and it also provided some questions. So um, leaders could self-reflect on their own performance and are they doing what they need to do to successfully navigate the pandemic? So these are just some sample questions that are found in that article and I, I, won't, I won't read them for you, but it's just an idea of how the college supports health leaders and keeps them thinking about their performance, keeps them thinking and supporting their leadership and, and continuously developing your, your leadership style. So we came up with a one pager. The ideas were we're sending things out that people can pull it, put on their bulletin board as quick references um, for the research and what to think about. And then we always map things to leads. Leads is our foundational leadership development framework. And whenever we come out with things, we map it to leads so that people who are comfortable with that leads language can really understand how and, and what it is that, you know, that they should be thinking about doing. So that's stage four, more research on stage four in this recovery. There was rapid research done where um, Jason reached out to, over, to almost 100 CEOs across Canada and senior leaders with three, three questions. For the recovery stage, what are the priorities what are the capabilities you need? And what are some keys to success? So he's come up with um, these capabilities. This, this word cloud, the larger words are the ones that were most mentioned by the CEOs. So transparent communication, building relationships, empathy, collaboration, resilience. These are all capabilities of leaders as you move through recovery. And the four keys to success, restoration, shift towards community-based community approach to healthcare across the spectrum of care, transformational changes, and identifying proven and emerging leaders 
um, and succession planning. So that stage four is similar to stage three, but it's it's a bigger picture kind of things. And you're, you're keeping that momentum of things that happened during the crisis, the gaps that were identified, and how do you keep going while taking care of yourself and the staff as well. So back in March, 2020, this is how it started. One little webinar that was pulled together really quickly and then how it's going. So Jason with his research now has a series of leading in the pandemic um, articles in hospital news. He was published with his co-authors in uh, JAMA. And as a consequence of that publication has been invited to the World Health Organization to act as a consultant on leading during a crisis in healthcare. So, you know, these are some of the things that Jason has been doing. The college has supported him. We had funding from Healthcare Excellence Canada, and it's supporting health leaders to think about where they are and where they're going. And this, for me, as the vice president at the college, this is the driving force behind everything we do is that alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And it's, it, it couldn't be more true during the pandemic. So that is the end of my presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Stefan. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, you know, our colleague, Jason, is the one that normally presents this, uh, this information. And so uh, in a pinch, Brenda uh, volunteered to, uh, to, to help out with the presentation. And so you did terrific. Thank you so much for, uh, for presenting this, Brenda. Uh, okay, so I've shared my screen should have a, uh, uh, can, can anybody confirm that you see my, uh, my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, so as uh, Mary Eleanor uh, mentioned, my name is Stéphane Joinette and I am the manager of professional certifications and strategic alliances at the Canadian College of Health Leaders. Uh, I am thrilled to be here uh, speaking with you. Um, and, and so what I'm going to do now is just provide you a very brief overview of, uh, of the Canadian College of Health Leaders, uh, benefits, uh, I'm going to talk about the Certified Health Executive, which is our CHE uh, designation. So the Canadian College of Health Leaders is a uh, national not-for-profit membership-based organization, and what we do do is uh, provide a network, provide tools and resources, and uh, support uh, to leaders so that they can make a difference in healthcare. So the college has been around for a little over 50 years. We celebrated our 50th anniversary uh, last year. We had some big plans. We were going to celebrate it uh, the right way, but then obviously because of the pandemic, we weren't able to, uh, to follow through with, with many of our plans. Uh, so there are a little over 4,000 members uh, at the college, and uh, they range uh, from every health sector and region in Canada, uh, namely uh, a big chunk of our, uh, of our memberships come from, as you can see, Ontario, BC, Alberta, and then the, uh, the, the other uh, chapters. So we have about... Uh, 20 chapters across the country. And so we've been recruiting members across the country. We've been very successful in initiating strategic alliance partnerships with, uh, uh, with people across the country. And we'll get into that in, in a bit. Uh, a little bit more about our, uh, our memberships makeup. Uh, we have uh, about 40, oh, I don't see the details, 60% are female, 40% uh, are male. And uh, here is just some more details about uh, uh, the, the, the sectors that, uh, that our members are in. So what does the college do? Uh, well, we have several uh, products that we, that we share with our members. Uh, we have... Uh, Sorry, just a little lost here because my, my screen's not on the right thing here. But we do uh, a lot of uh, e-learning. We have a mentorship program. We have um, a lot of, uh, uh, we do some career coaching. We have our leadership uh, newsletters. Uh, 
Uh, we also have a publication, a monthly pu publication that talks about health. And so one thing that's really interesting is that about a year before the pandemic started, uh, Teresa Tam was a contributor in our forum publication. And this was talking about uh, the uh, a, a potential pandemic. So there was a lot of uh, there was some prescience in there. And so we also have a national awards program, and then there are ways to uh, grow your network. Uh, we have a number of conferences. So we have our, our national conference, which is held in June or in May or June every year. We have our, our Canada West conference, and then we have social media. But something that's really new that I wanted to highlight is our circle. Our circle uh, and I saw this for the very first time yesterday. Brenda and uh, my colleagues are working on this uh, brand new networking site. And it's sort of like a Facebook or LinkedIn, but it's for all CCHL members. And it is just so impressive. And so we're, we're launching that uh, at the end of October. And we're just really looking forward to sharing that with all of our members. We also, as I mentioned, have about, uh, well, we have 20 local chapters across the country. Uh, the one that you're uh, based in is the Blue Nose chapter. And so here are the uh, details for the chair, if ever you want to get in touch with, uh, with them. But uh, we also have Krista Smith. Krista Smith is a, a recent graduate of uh, this program, and she has her CHE. And so Krista, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, can you tell us what the college means to you and why you became a member and how you benefited from uh, the membership? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I think I had the easiest part of the presentation because I just get to speak about my own experience. Um, so for me, um, when I went into formal leadership, um, so I took my first manager position in 2017. Um, prior to that, I was a direct care nurse and had my people. So I, I had my people, they were telling me all these great educational opportunities. I knew the connects because it was the nursing world and that was my education. And, you know, I had those connects, I had that support. And I found when I went into management, I really quickly lost a lot of my connects and I lost, you know, my people, like my my community in a way. And so for me, when I heard about CCHL, I was like, this is perfect. I can find, this is my new community, right? These are other health leaders from across Canada um, that I can reach out to and I can network with and I'm new and, you know, there's so much for me to learn. So the really, the why for me was that I kind of felt alone when I went into formal leadership um, and felt like, you know, I've always joined whatever I could. And this was the perfect fit um, as a health leader. Um, and I quickly learned too that, you know, as I spoke with great leaders, amazing leaders, I've had a wonderful opportunity through the college to speak with very experienced leaders. And I really realized that um, just because I'm a formal leader, you know, it, it, it's not all, that's not the only leadership in health. And they really helped me to see that leadership is really a verb. It's not a noun and it's how you show up. And so I really found my community with CCHL and that really drove me to join Blue Nose. So I'm actually on the Blue Nose chapter with Brent. Um, so I joined the Blue Nose chapter in 2020 and that was even better because now I sat on the, I'm sitting on the board for Blue Nose and now I'm really connected and I get to see all kinds of different perspectives. So that's really my why and, you know, what it means to me. I really feel that management and leadership, no matter at what level, it can be kind of lonely. Um, so when you have that community to really support you through those times, um, it's really, really helped me as I've progressed in my leadership. Terrific. Thank you, Krista. Jeez, I think we're going to ask you to, to present a, at all of our other presentations. <laughs> Fantastic. Actually, can you uh, tell me what's coming up in your chapter? Sure. Um, so we took a little bit of a break over the summer. Um, COVID has definitely had some impacts on our connection, but we've stayed connected through email throughout the summer. Um, we're looking at some uh, some new I can't totally say what they're what's happening specifically with our education but there's going to be some really exciting educational opportunities 
Um, Brent is not only our chair, but he also leads our education committee. So I sit on the education committee with Brent. So we have some ideas floating around. We're just trying to confirm. So there's going to be some great um, education opportunities. The other thing that we recently did in the spring was a virtual um, speed dating. Um, so we do collaborate with a lot of the universities in Nova Scotia and PEI, and it was an opportunity for students to join us on Zoom, and then we did breakout rooms. Um, and they had some say in, in you know, who their, can, their person would be, and we basically just rotated around the virtual areas to each other and they had specific questions that they could ask us and then I stay connected to some of them now so it was a great way for students that were coming into health leadership or interested in health leadership to really connect with a health leader that's already in some systems so we did that and I think that was a great success so we'll probably do that again we're also looking at um, how we can better network um, and build those relationships because um, really our strongest connect right now is Dalhousie, which is great that that's this group. Um, but we're also looking at the other universities um, in both Nova Scotia and PEI and just can we how can we expand um, that networking with those students, as well as um, networking with other partners and stuff. So I think a lot of things are going to happen this fall. I wish I had a more specific update that I could share with really exciting, you know, titles and this is happening here, but we're still finalizing some of that. But I'm happy to share with anybody that's interested once once we're done, I don't know if that's appropriate. I'm very open to people communicating and connecting with me. Um, I share my email with everyone. I think everyone has it. So um, <laughs> I'm not opposed to that. So I think there's some really great things coming up with our chapter. Great. Thank you so much. That sounds terrific. Uh, okay, so we'll continue with uh, uh, offerings that uh, the CCHL uh, provides. So the CCHL is also a provider of the LEADS Leadership Framework. And so uh, Brenda is the brains behind uh, the, uh, the LEADS uh, framework at the college. And so Brenda, can you tell us a bit more about the, uh, the LEADS framework? Happy to tell you about it. And there, um, so LEADS, you might have heard us mention LEADS as we go through. It is um, foundational to everything we do as far as leadership development goes at the college. It's a big part of our certified health executive program. It's a Canadian innovation for leadership in healthcare with some very distinct difference makers in it. So we'll go to the next slide, please, Steph. So why leads? And you can just keep going. So it's a common language. It's the, the number one most used leadership framework in healthcare. And so regardless of where you're working, if you have this leads uh, framework, it's very easy to use. It's very memorable. It's uh, intuitive. <laughs> Steph, you're you're going you're going fast. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> it's okay. It's based in evidence, so it, um, it it was a research project at Royal Road University in British Columbia. It's we have a refresh and development process, so that it's continuing continuously being evolved to reflect how it's being used and applied. It is designed for healthcare specific. It's the only framework we've come across that's designed specifically for healthcare. There are other leadership frameworks out there for sure, um, but this one is focused on healthcare. It's universally applic applicable regardless of your, your level within the organization, and it's very intuitive. I just literally got off a webinar with the CEO of a very large long-term care facility in Alberta. She was talking about how she used leads um, herself personally and how she uses it to solve problems as well um, during a crisis and during emergencies. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So why leads? The, the different, we, we did some mapping and had some research done on what, what makes leads different than the other models out there. And it's the D and the S. So the LEA is leading yourself, engaging others, achieving results. The D is developing coalitions and the S is the systems transformation piece, which really is unique to healthcare because it's, it's about working together for a greater good. And systems transformation, we, we recognize that we all need that. And um, so that was what sets leads apart from others. And it's got four levels of leadership. So you have um, frontline leaders, managerial leader, uh, and director level leaders, and executive leaders. So we have behaviors described for all levels of leadership. Um, and you can go ahead, Steph, and 
I think there's a little bit more. So this is an example. Oh, go back. <laughs> This is an example. So the domain is called is lead self, and that's the L. And the in the turquoise there are four capabilities: self-awareness, managing yourself, developing yourself, demonstrating character. So we've circled self-awareness. So on the next slide, you'll see that we've got behaviors described for what does self-awareness look like for these four levels of leadership. So frontline leaders, this is what it looks like in practice. Mid-level leaders, this is what it looks like. Senior level executive leaders. And it is meant to be cumulative so that executive leaders have this awareness of, of all levels. However, when you're starting out and when you're, when you're def defining your own leadership style, the art of yourself as a leader, these behaviors help you understand what your strengths are, what you need to um, perhaps develop or what you know what you need to perhaps compensate for if, if it's not a strength that you're comfortable with. So we'll go to the next slide. So the impact of leads, we had a MITAX study done, a postdoctoral research um, study to look at people who had adopted leads organizationally and across an organization, what was the impact of using leads for the organization? So at an individual level, people reported that they were more engaged, they felt more efficient because they used leads as a change model, um, they felt more effective because they were, they were able to define the end point of a project they were working on. They, it, there was a lot of clarity around their, their work and they felt enabled because they, there was an understanding of this distributed leadership and empowering, empowering of um, all levels of, of leadership. So it's leadership without title. And then at the organizational level, organizations rep reported the benefits of the common language. So at all four levels of leadership, everyone understood and lived leads. Um, framing of common tasks and goals. So you could take a, a project and you could frame it in the leads framework. How are we gonna lead ourselves? How are we going to engage with others? What's, what's the result we're trying to achieve? Who do we need to work with? And ultimately, why are we doing this? There's greater trust and collaboration. There's innovation and the culture shift to lead a leadership organization. So, so it's, it's a never ending journey, but there's the shift towards a flattening of the hierarchy um, and distributed leadership. And is that it? Is that for the last slide, Steph? That's your last okay. slide, Brenda. You're off the hook now. <laughs> all right. So thank you very much, Brenda. So with all this said, why would you want to join the college? Well, we, we will help you build your network through a bunch of conferences, webinars, and networking events. Uh, we'll talk about the certification in just a moment. Uh, we'll also inspire your thinking, and that's uh, through, uh, we have special events like national debates on healthcare. We have chapter events like that uh, speed networking uh, event that, uh, that Krista was talking about, and will also help develop your potential. And so we have opportunities for, for mentoring and volunteering. And so uh, with that, uh, we do have membership fees. So every year we have annual fees. And so the, the fees that are on here now on this slide, these are about to change in January. Just a, a, a heads up. And so while you're a student, your annual membership fee is $70 per year. And that's for up to a maximum of five years. If you wait until January, then you can keep paying. Uh, I, I believe the rate is going up to $75, but uh, you can only pay that rate for a maximum of four years. And so we do have a graduated entry uh, fee structure if you graduate from this program and then you're no longer a student. So your first year would be 160, second year 160, three year, uh, third year with, is 320, and then fourth year and beyond is at the regular price of $475. All right, so very quickly, uh, this, uh, I would love to talk about the CHE, the Certified Health Executive Select Program. So the CHE is the only 
leadership designation in Canada for all health leaders. Uh, since we've overhauled this, uh, this program about two years ago, there's been a major cross-Canadian movement to adopt the CHE as the designation of choice. Uh, the program is fully aligned to the LEADS domains, as uh, 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 Brenda uh, mentioned earlier. It also supports self-directed and lifelong learning. And we survey all candidates uh, on their experience through the, uh, the, the program uh, at the very end, as soon as they achieve the, uh, the designation. And so one of the things that really stands out in their evaluations is that this program provides a tremendous opportunity for self-reflection. Uh, uh, also, having the designation demonstrates a dedication to leadership in healthcare. And as we've been saying early uh, throughout this presentation, it also allows you to increase your network with like-minded individuals. So uh, two years ago, we uh, revamped the program. And so we've seen a, a huge increase in uh, registrations. Uh, so we now currently have uh, 2,200 uh, there are 2,200 Canadians with the CHE designation. And so we're not just seeing an increase in uh, CHEs, we're also seeing an increase in strategic alliance partnerships. And so we have two, well, several types of uh, partnerships, but we have employer partnerships. Uh, namely, what, what might be of interest to you is that we have strategic alliance partnerships with the Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, Eastern Health, Horizon Health Network, and we're also working on other uh, partnerships. But what that means to you is that these organizations have committed to promoting the CHE designation and the college and the LEADS uh, framework. And um, when they're hiring individuals, they're specifically looking for individuals that have the designation. So good to know. We also have a number of uh, academic partnerships from coast to coast. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them all right now, but you'll notice that the uh, Dalhousie uh, logo is there. Uh, we have, so the college has its uh, national mentorship program, which, is, uh, which offers general uh, mentorship on any type of topic, but the CHE program also offers a dedicated mentorship program. So if, you, if you're looking for some additional guidance through the, uh, the CHE program, you just, uh, it's sort of like a dating app where you put in your information and the mentors put in their information and then there's a match and then you connect with each other. So to be eligible for the uh, CHE program, there are two ways to get in. And I'm not going to get into the details because I'm sort of running out of time. Uh, but if you're enrolled in this program through Dalhousie, you qualify for the CHE program. So what you'd need to apply is a detailed resume, a letter of support. So the letter of support uh, needs to come from your current or past employer or somebody that has the CHE designation already. And if you can't get any of that, on the application page, uh, we have a letter of support form. So that's a questionnaire that you complete yourself. There's about 10 or 12 questions. You answer that and that can be used in lieu of a letter of support. And so because there's a number of, uh, of benefits to you uh, through this strategic alliance, we'll also need a proof of, of enrollment or a proof of completion of this program. So we'll, we'll go through the requirements of the program really quickly because uh, the students in, in your program or in this program are exempt from most of them. So the very first step is a LEADS 360 assessment and a coach debrief. Uh, and I believe the uh, uh, experienced leaders are already doing this through your program. And so the uh, emergent leaders will be required to do a LEADS 360. So that's the uh, same thing as your, uh, uh, what did you call it? Your, your circle report, right? And so you'll be required to do that. And so then uh, a, an outcome of your, and, and that includes uh, a coach debrief. An outcome of that report 
is the creation of a leadership development plan. And so that's basically uh, just creating a plan for uh, the near future and the future based on the leads framework. So that is for the emergent leaders. So for everybody, so the emergent leaders and the experienced leaders are exempt from the leads learning program. And so this is huge because this is the only part of the program that carries an additional cost. And this is uh, very involved. There's about 50 hours worth of work included in the leads learning, but we've, uh, we've, uh, we've mapped out your curriculum and it's, uh, it meets the requirement of our leads uh, learning component of the program. So you don't have to do that. Another exemption that you get is the leads in action project. So I'm not gonna go into detail for that because you don't have to do it. Uh, and you're also exempt from the final evaluation. We used to have an exam, which we've eliminated. We've eliminated. Uh, now what we do is a self-evaluation, which is a, a follow-up on the leadership development plan that you've created at the beginning of the process. But because uh, this uh, Dalhousie program has uh, uh, an evaluation incorporated into the program, you're exempt from that. So the CHE program, what does it cost? Well, for experienced leaders, the cost is $520, which is a fantastic deal because the regular price is $1,600. And so for the emergent leaders, it's $900. It's a little more because uh, you have to go do the, uh, the leads 360 assessment. And so we incur some cost. And so we're, we're, we're trying to cover our cost. So as a, uh, students in the strategic alliance partnership, you have a number of, uh, of benefits, which I just mentioned. So some of you are exempt from the LEADS 360 and uh, the Leadership Development Plan, and you're all exempt from the LEADS Learning Series and the LEADS in Action Project and the self-evaluation. And so once you complete the program, uh, you get a number of maintenance of certification credits. And uh, you're also exempt from uh, collecting that minimum of uh, work experience. And so I have another slide here for maintenance of certification, but we've run out of time. I really, really want to uh, get to your questions. And so we're going to uh, share this uh, slide deck with uh, Mary Eleanor. She's gonna share it with you. And so we'll also provide some, some other material. So I'm gonna stop sharing my, my screen and uh, perhaps we can get to some questions. Thank you very much. So Mary Eleanor, did you want to uh, facilitate the Q&A? All right, well, while we're waiting for Mary Eleanor, uh, looks like uh, Todd has a question. Uh, can you go over the benefits if you're already a CHE? Are there any components that CHEs don't need to do? Oh, that's a good question. I think that's a question for, uh, for Scott. I'm just looking at Todd's question. Um, so if they have a CHE already, are there any components of your program that they're exempt from? Uh, there, no, we wouldn't, no. We don't have currently anything that, that would exempt them if they have a CHE. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Questions, comments, things that you heard that you like, things that you um, resonated or stood out with you? You can either uh, just speak, just turn on your mic and your, you know, unmute, or you can actually just put them in the chat. Yeah, uh, you know, while we're waiting a question for for questions, uh, Krista, uh, perhaps you can talk about your experience through the CAG program. Sure. Yeah. So I can't talk about CHE without talking about my strategic leadership certificate because I went through that process. So. 
I was in the emerging leaders group um, for the strategic leadership certificate. So that was in, I think we finished that in 2019. Um, so from that, it was great. We found out that, you know, CHE, CCHL was looking at allowing that to be part of the CHE program. And it was great for all of us to, to learn that information. So, you know, getting the CHE um, and working through that. So for me with the emerging, I still had to do the LEADS 360 assessment. Um, so either way you go, that was I want to do one of those every year. Like, honestly, <laughs> I found that super helpful. I think, um, you know, one of the first thing of leads as Brenda was saying is lead self and you really have to be self-aware and know your own leadership style and how you're showing up and how you're in, you know, all of that stuff. And without truly reflecting and having others reflect on your leadership, you don't really have a true sense. So um, the CHE program for me was, it was actually it was enjoyable work to work through the 360 and then also to have like those coaching sessions. And I find all of that very, very helpful. And as you mentioned, Stefan, like the CHE designation does appear on all of our um, management positions at Nova Scotia Health. So for me, I always saw it there and it was like this thing I wanted to achieve and CCHL made it so easy. The strategic leadership already had such a foundation for me um, coming from, you know, the emotional intelligence thing that we had to do in the first session. I was privileged enough to have Scott as one of our instructors for our team, um, the teams and relationship management. So I felt like the certificate program gave such a great base to then move into the CHE designation, do the 360, have the coaching sessions. Like I felt, felt like I already had a really great foundation for the designation. Um, and then moving through it, I already had an idea from the certificate program. So it was a really kind of seamless thing that happened for me that that made it, a, I don't know, more enjoyable because it's just my experience, but it was a very enjoyable experience and it was very easy to kind of move through one into the other. Thank you. Thank you. And, and apologies all, I'm just going to... Oh. Oh. I see Natasha has a uh, has a question here. She's asking how long the program uh, is, and I think uh, I'm just gonna the the quick answer for the CHE program is that if you're an experienced leader, the CHE program will take you two minutes. You just need to apply to the program because you're exempt for all steps. Uh, if you are an emergent leader, uh, then all you have to do is the 360, and uh, that'll take you on average, about four months. Uh, now, as far as the uh, the Dalhousie the program is, is concerned, Scott, perhaps you can address that. So we have modules that are running um, on a two-week basis and there are five modules. So it, it's approximately three months, two to three months. Mm. So it's, um, and you know, I just would like to comment on Chris because she was just so, I wish she would speak on our behalf as well because she just articulated that so well. And there's no one better to do it than somebody who's been through the program. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, right. So I think that I think that Mary Eleanor is having significant technical difficulties. So I we're. Can, um, you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. I'm very sorry. My video is not working anymore. But um, for whatever reason. <laughs> Oh, there's um, mm. there's a really a lot of a lot of um, back feed noise on it. Yes, yeah, my apology. So we're just coming to a close, and so maybe on 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 behalf of Mary Mary Elliter and others, I'd like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank everybody who came, and um, I realize that your time is precious, and there's lots of things that you could be doing. So I really hope that you have any questions, you reach out, but we'll also be reaching out to all of you as well. Yeah. Any other comments or closing comments from the other panelists? Uh, I would like to uh, thank Mary Eleanor, uh, Mary Eleanor to, uh, for, for coordinating this event and uh, for inviting us to, uh, to participate and speak with all of you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I did echo Stefan's comments. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time you. and hopefully we will see you in some, at some point. Our paths will cross. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.